welcome back. We have joining us via Zoom this morning is the Executive Director of the Child Development Foundation, mm -hmm. Diana Shaw. Good morning, Diana. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. Good yes. morning, Belize. <laughs> uh, well, Diana, I am so happy that you're here because we have been talking about different... Um, not just therapy but different foundations that do service for their communities last week we had um talking about um, the raging of gangs and so forth in in yes. the communities and so um shifting focus into what the child development foundation um we were talking briefly about the difference between the church service and the world service so for the folks at home can you tell us a little bit more about what you do and what those services mean all right so we are a christian social justice organization we are based in belmapan in the Cayo district and i say to people when people ask me because i'm an ordained minister of the gospel but i am also an attorney at law mm -hmm. so i have two hats and the organization reflects a lot of that i always say to people i feel our organization has two focus one is a focus to the church to better equip the church to serve the world and a focus to the world to help to address the needs of hurting people. Mm -hmm. So both of it are about helping people to help others and to equip them, especially around gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. Our particular focus is to have a community-based response to gender-based violence, particularly sexual violence against women and girls, issues around sexual abuse, commercial sexual exploitation, domestic violence, and human trafficking are the areas where we provide services. And our services include prevention, they include protection, and they include rehabilitation and recovery. Mm. Ironically, those three points that you made are very prevalent in Belize when you look at domestic violence, commercial sexual exploitation, mm -hmm. and gender-based violence and what have you. Where you are in terms of being able to carry out your functions, um, who is the public that CDF caters to in this case? So mainly women and girls. I, mm -hmm. I would say that that's our primary focus, but we do offer services to men and boys as well because we have different programs that we do. Our flagship program is our counseling center, which is headquartered in Belmopan. Mm -hmm. And through the counseling center, we provide professional therapeutic counseling. We have trained counselors. We have three counselors. Um, we are, now we have added a fourth counselor who is a psychiatric nurse practitioner mm -hmm. with a specific focus on human trafficking for the expansion of our human trafficking work. We have Mr. Tom Sharp, who is our clinical supervisor, who has a master's degree in family therapy. And we have um, Monica Villanueva, who is just joining us, fresh from Jamaica, completing her master's degree. And we also have Ms. Rianne Pennell, who, Rianne Pennell, who is a specialist on domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So our counseling program reaches over 100 people every year. We provide more than 300 counseling sessions um, annually. We help women who are in domestic violence situations to um, develop safety plans. We help to get them out of domestic violence and we provide psychosocial support to connect them to other services, supporting them to report to the police, supporting them to court services and also then providing the counseling therapy to help them to recover from the trauma that they have experienced. Mm -hmm. And we do the same thing to children who are victims of sexual abuse. We work closely with the Department of Human Services particularly here in the Kaya district to provide that counseling support. That's a free, all of those services are free services. And it is free because we have strong partnerships with UNICEF under the Spotlight Initiative to pay for those services and also the private sector donations from Universal Hardware, um, Builders Hardware in Belmopan, mm -hmm. the Social Security Board and several other private sector donors that make these services possible. And then we have a service that's specific to migrants, where we partner with IOM, which is part of the UN, to do a migrant resource center that we have here in Belmopan that allows persons who are irregular or undocumented to get assistance to get regularized so that they are not vulnerable 
And then through that, we also identify women and girls who are in gender-based violence situations and provide support to them to help them in those situations. So, um, Diana, I have a, a more of a personal question for you. And I guess because you've been doing this since 2000, I believe. Um, the organization has been, I've been doing it since, since 2000, mm -hmm. but as a formal organization, we were incorporated in 2008. Right. So how does a lawyer then become a a pastor and then you know ventures into this journey i guess it's one of those things that god has to make clear to you i don't mm -hmm. think that i set out originally to do this my original dream was just to be an attorney i came from jamaica in 1999 mm -hmm. and my big goal was to be a civil litigator make lots of money and live on the beach <laughs> and retire young that was my big dream and then I told my mother I would volunteer in the church and I was in Central Assemblies of God Church because she wanted to make sure I was doing something fruitful with my life. And while volunteering in the church, I discovered children who were experiencing abuse mm -hmm. and realized that as a church, we needed to have a better response that collaborated more with the government sector and other services, law enforcement that those children would need and that those families would need mm -hmm. for effective recovery. So I started doing that almost as a volunteer kind of extracurricular activity outside of my law practice. I was then with Baron Company, but soon that became my full time focus because mm -hmm. so many people heard about what I was doing and started calling, asking for help. Mm -hmm. And so eventually I felt that the Lord was telling me that that's what I needed to be doing and not civil litigation. So I gave up my law work and went into that full time. And the rest is history. It has been a wonderful, though often challenging journey. I love so it. you've <laughs> essentially found your vocation, your, your yeah. true calling. calling. Yeah. And yes. in the process of having found your calling, you are able to assist as many people who find themselves in these kind of yes. situations that you've described. Mm -hmm. Let me ask another question here, Diana. So you've transitioned to focusing full-time on this particular foundation and providing the kinds of services necessary for these people to be able to have their issues addressed. Mm -hmm. Another personal question, what sense of, of satisfaction do you get from being able to help a child in a particular situation, being able to help a mother in a particular situation and seeing this all the way through? Oh, it's amazing. I think perhaps, they, and this is what keeps me going, because I said there are challenges. I mean, there was a huge pay cut when I stepped out of law mm -hmm. practice into full-time volunteer work. And eventually, I started doing consultancies and supporting law reform projects that now also give me a bigger platform, even in other countries, mm -hmm. to expand this kind of work. But that took some time to build up. So there were a lot of challenges al along the way, but I also saw a lot of successes. Mm -hmm. When we work closely with families and we provide what I kind of, I call wraparound services, this is a phrase I often heard um, former CEO Judith Al Alpuche use and which I have adopted because I realized that a lot of families, especially when you have a situation that a child has been abused, the abuse is one thing. But it's not the only thing that the family is dealing with. For a family to become a place where a child is unsafe, a lot of other things have broken down in that family. There is a lot of other dysfunction. Many times the mother is not working. She may be facing domestic violence. She may have been a victim of abuse herself in her past that was never addressed, that she never received counseling for. There may be a situation where the perpetrator is somebody who is a breadwinner for the family. Mm -hmm. So there are all of these other dynamics that are at play that you also have to help families to grapple with. And we found that when we are able to come alongside families and walk through the journey with them, we have a better chance of success than if just social work is doing it on their own. Because sometimes they are not able to have the insight in the family. Sometimes families are suspicious of government authorities. They don't trust the social workers. They won't disclose everything to them. But when we have our counselor working with the child, working with the family, and then liaising with human services, you get a fuller response. It, it, it's a more community-oriented response that comes around and supports the family, and it increases the chances of success and recovery. 
So that has really been our model of intervention, and that has been very successful. We have had a lot of success um, in helping clients who have experienced abuse to recover from that and then to go back into society and to be fruitful and productive and to break those abuse chains in their families so that the next generation has, is, is freer from that. We also see when we work with women with domestic violence, it's the same kind of service that we provide. We are able to help them to rebuild connections with their family. Many women who experience domestic violence, they get isolated from their family. Mm -hmm. The perpetrator isolates them from their family support. And sometimes they feel bad about the experience that they're having. They feel guilty, blame themselves, and they don't share this with family members. Some family members don't even know. Yeah. But when we become involved, and we are able to reach out to the family members on their behalf and say, look here, your family member is going through a difficult situation. Or a counselor needs for you to come in because we need somebody in this family to be a champion, to help her through this. We are going to help you, but we also need you to help her. And people generally respond positively to that. And then from that, we are able to have a better family response so that even after the counselling is finished, we know that that person is going to have a support in their family that's going to help them with the long-term recovery that they need to do. So I think that has really what has helped to be successful. When we started our prevention programs in schools with Rise Girls, which we started with the CAMI Fund and with UNICEF in 2014, we also incorporated this, that when we talk to girls about her providing sexual reproductive health information, we talk to them about dating violence, we also have sessions with the parents mm -hmm. because you also need to ensure that they are going to have a strong network around them to support them as they're dealing with those challenges. And that kind of community-based wraparound response to us has been very successful. And we try to model that in all aspects of the work that we do, whether it's with human trafficking, with migrants, domestic violence, or child abuse. Well, um, CDF and I... You know, initially when I was reading about your foundation, I, I thought it was just catering to children, but it seems like it's a very holistic, very versatile um, foundation. Uh, can you talk to us? I, I think in the beginning you mentioned about rehabilitation and youth services. Uh, can yes. you give us a little bit more detail about that kind of um, program and how you're able to help children and youths in particular? All right. So for our youth work, we have a community-based program that works through schools. We call it the Rise Girls, Reviving Initiatives, Supporting and Engaging Girls, which, as I said, we started in 2014, mm -hmm. then with the support of UNICEF, and then also the CAMI Fund and some smaller donations from Social Security Board and some private sector donors. Mm -hmm. And essentially, that's a one-year mentorship and support program that we go into schools, and part of it is general awareness raising amongst girls about issues that impact girls during their adolescence, um, issues like child abuse, issues like dealing with bullying, issues like cyber safety. Um, we talk about dating violence, and then we provide information on sexual and reproductive health development. We talk about menstruation, your adolescent body development. We, we have sessions on how you choose the right bra, how you choose the right pad, how you deal with cramps. We have all kinds of things that affect girls during their adolescent years. And it's geared to helping them to become more settled and have higher self-esteem and awareness of themselves and become more confident in who they are as an, in, as an individual. And then being able to support each other's development in a positive way so that we have stronger school retention, less dropouts, less issues with girls leaving school to engage in child marriage and early union. The other component of that is the parents. Mm -hmm. They are a part of the program and there are sessions that they have to participate in where we talk to the parents about the, what it means to be raised an adolescent girl, what are the things that she's going to be facing, how you need to support that. We talk about how you rebuild communication, how you address the issues that as a parent you are having with your adolescent teen and how you need to support her development and her individuality. And some of those sessions with parents have been some of the most eye-opening. A lot of parents have come and have said to me that they wish they had something like that when they were growing up. 
like they never had anybody that talked to them about how to put on a pad how to choose the right pads for different kinds of flows and just mm -hmm. basic things about hygiene mm -hmm. and self-care for women that allow me to to interject <laughs> just momentarily <laughs> simply because i get passionate about this design and no, i get carried away and I please get passionate that. yes i respect and appreciate that um my 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 reason for interjecting here is because naturally i'm thinking that when you have an adolescent child an adolescent a, a female particularly mm -hmm. that ordinarily they have these kinds of conversations with their mothers like i'm just thinking i may be completely far off the that's what here. we thought oh, yeah. and then we started asking and the mothers were like i don't know how to talk about it's a very very that. um i, I think so almost better. um strange or or, or, or or uncomfortable it shouldn't be comfortable yes. um, uncomfortable because it's a natural thing but for yes. some reason it we is. can't sit as women and be like so your flow today what kind yes. what you know we we can't do that and i don't know why really it's it's a it's a difficult conversation to have but no isani we don't talk <laughs> about those things yes. unfortunately and that's what we discovered and then i would do sessions uh -huh. with parents and then i would say to them so what do you talk to your daughter about i mean your daughter is 30 you know she's developing breasts mm -hmm. and she's very self-conscious how do you help her to choose the right bra for her body type and ensures that she's not self-conscious about this if somebody's teasing her and they're like well you know if tell her about that the teacher's supposed to tell her I'm like, who's the teacher going to tell her? The teacher don't live on your house. And, yeah. You know, and I want to also bring up the point. I, I like that you said that because we don't give proper sex education and, yes. and biological uh, education in that aspect. Not even for boys, you know. And it, it's one of those uh, weird conversations where nobody really knows what size of bra you're supposed to actually wear. But because I do not know, to know because the next one don't know, we yeah. bully each other because we don't know anything. Right. And that is where that, um, that, that self-consciousness continues to grow yes. throughout high school because yes. you are 100% insecure about the way you, you feel. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So that's come to one of your sessions, um, Diana. Oh, yes, the, <laughs> the parents love it. The teachers love it as well. So initially I started with me just having discussions with the girls and mm -hmm. we have rap sessions and they could ask me anything and then we would we talk about it mm -hmm. then i started training um other peer support and young women who we brought into the organization to then do this and then with unicef and cami fund we developed a full curriculum mm -hmm. that actually shows them how to engage the conversation and then we had a component for parents and we have a part in the curriculum where the parents have like a model conversation. So they get to learn how to have these kinds of conversations and how to talk about it, how to deal with questions that the teenage girls have and create a safe space for well, them to build that engagement. Diana, so, so it has been really good. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about future endeavors as we're as we're wrapping up our show this yes. well, our segment this morning. So two big things we are doing this year, we are continuing all of those programs and then we are expanding our human trafficking work. We have just completed a shelter that will provide rescue and rehabilitation services for women uh, rescued from human trafficking situations. We have al always been working alongside ATIPS and supporting immigration department in providing awareness and training. But we have discovered that there is a need to provide specific um, spaces, especially for migrant women rescued from trafficking, where they can have long-term rehabilitation and recovery. So that's we have just completed that, and that's going to be on board. We are also expanding psychosocial support services. As I said, we have taken on additional counselors because we realize that especially coming out of COVID, a lot of persons a lot of issues that they are not, not dealt with adequately and it's creating some mental health needs amongst our women children especially and so we are going to be expanding those services and with iom we are supporting the amnesty program and then once the amnesty program is finished we are going to be looking at integration services how do we ensure that these persons who have now become regularized by receiving permanent residency through the amnesty program are best equipped to fully participate in the economy and to be productive in society to address any issues that they may have with gender-based violence any psychosocial support needs that they may have 
so that they can be better parents, they can fully support our communities, and so that we come out of this stronger. So those will be some of the focuses that we will have. Of course, we're going to continue our spotlight work with UNICEF, with family violence, um, working on preventing domestic violence, child sexual abuse. We're going to continue the counseling center, and we're also going to continue our Rise Girls program in the schools here in the Kaya District. Uh, well, the Child Development Foundation. Thank you so much, Diana, for uh, zooming in with us to talk to us a little bit more about it. I didn't know you were in Belmopan, so I have to stop by and, and check out yes, your office. Yes, absolutely. Um, we are at 13 Garbot Creek Street. Oh, Feel free I know to stop that. by. <laughs> you can reach us on Facebook. We're on Facebook as well at CDF Belize. You can find us on WhatsApp, 615-7010. Uh, you can find us on the internet, our website, cdfbenies.org. Awesome. Thank you so much, Diana. And we will continue this conversation more so often because it is needed. Um, and with that, we're going to take our next break. But before we do, Phoenix Boutique's Look of the Week. Check it out. Welcome to the Phoenix Boutique. Here's our Look of the Week concert ready. We have a Zara bodycon coral dress with wooden neckline, a Zara irregular mirrored earrings, and it's completed with the Zara platform heels. Mm -hmm. 